What an absolutely crazy time it has been for me for the past several weeks. Even though I had been anticipating it, the Supreme Court's recent ruling on marriage equality literally upended my world. Instead of my typical one or two holy unions per year, suddenly I was faced with 11 weddings within a week's time. And all for the public's viewing pleasure, news reporters kept shoving microphones and cameras in my face to record my reactions to the week's events. The hyperspeed at which everything seemed to be happening left very little time for me to process it all. The future implications the ruling will have on families and the workplace, the witness of 11 couples joined together in love with even more weddings planned for the immediate future, my gratitude for all the people who pitched in to make those weddings happen, also the routine of everyday ministry could still take place. The many kind words of support, as well as the hurtful words that have begun to trickle in. It's a lot to take in. But I know my situation isn't a unique one. You know what it's like to have a life that seems to be spinning out of control. If you've ever received a surprise health diagnosis, or if you've gone through a breakup with someone who you cared deeply about, or if you've had to adjust your daily routines to the arrival of a new child into your household, or if you've ever lost your job and was suddenly faced with a fragile future. Your mind races at warp speed as you do your best to restack the blocks that have been scattered around the room of your soul, and you try to restore some order to a life that feels as if it has been swept away. Sometimes life just gets nuts. And that's when Jesus invites us to come away to a deserted place and rest a while. In this morning's passage, that's what he told his disciples who had been going through their own craziness. These men who had never hoped for more than from life than to scrape up enough money to put bread on the table at night. These same men had just returned from their own upended lives. They had been empowered by Jesus to preach and to heal and to cast out demons. And now they had all returned at the appointed time, babbling and laughing and crying and trying just as hard as you and I to make some sense of life when things no longer behave the way we have been accustomed to them behaving. And even while the disciples had been away on their mission, Jesus had been experiencing his own personal share of craziness. His own mentor, the very one whose message he would take up and proclaim for the rest of his own life, a man who went by the name of John the Baptizer. This man had been murdered by King Herod. So even as the disciples were laughing and celebrating the recent events in their own lives, Jesus was grieving the loss of someone who had meant very much to him. And so Jesus said, come away to a deserted place and rest a while. As addictive as the adrenaline rush may be, there comes a point when we just need to stop and rest. God has woven rest into the very fabric of nature. For much of the year, the seasons produce growth and fruit but in the winter, the earth settles into its annual rest. And certain flowers have a daily rest in which they close their petals as if tucking themselves in for the night in preparation for the approaching day. And the very God who appointed the seasons and created flowers rested after 
after the explosive creation of what we have come to know as our universe. Even God rested. So important is that rest. So critical is Sabbath rest for our physical and spiritual health that it was even included as one of the commandments which were given to, peop to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. We need rest, and yet we resist it. And so God commands it. In the 23rd Psalm, God makes me to lie down in green pastures. You would think that we would welcome rest, but we seem to do everything we can to avoid it. A recent poll indicates that the average work week is now 47 hours nearly a full extra eight-hour day. There are any number of reasons why we, so, why we work so much, some of them valid and justifiable, and some not so much. Theologian David Lowe points out that we are as enslaved as were the people of Israel to the Egyptians except ours is a self-constructed and self-imposed slavery, and therefore far more difficult to detect or overcome. He says we are enslaved to notions of success and therefore put few limits on work. We are enslaved to ideas about our children having every possible opportunity and therefore schedule them into frenetic lives and wonder why they have a hard time focusing. We are enslaved to the belief that the only thing that will bring contentment is more. More money, more space in our homes, more cars, more things to put on our resumes or in our closets, more. Go ahead, he says. Name that thing you've fallen prey to wanting more of. And such levels of wanting, quite frankly, don't permit much time for anything but work. But Jesus invites us to take a break and come away to a deserted place and rest a while. And if we take him up on it, we'll discover that the rest he calls us to is not an afternoon nap on the sofa, nor a vacation on a beach resort. As important as those things may be, they don't accomplish the same thing that Sabbath rest accomplishes. God calls us to abundant life. And contrary to the opinion of many people, abundance isn't a quantitative description of more, more, and yet even more. Instead, it's a qualitative description of what makes life worth living. Be honest with yourself. When is the last time you've gone for a walk, not for the sake of exercise, but for the purposes of relaxation. Or spent some time with the ones you love. Or enjoyed a meal with a friend. Each of you should have a post-it note. If you don't, there are some at the back of the sanctuary which you can pick up before leaving. On the note, write down or simply Think of one thing you will not do this week. One evening you will shut down your computer or turn off your cell phone. One appointment you will refuse to make. One obligation or opportunity you will forego. And after you have done that, write down one, write down or think of one thing you will actually do in order to rest. One walk you will take with a friend or spouse. 
one game you will play with a child or neighbor, one opportunity you will take to sit alone or with others, not in front of the television, but simply to contemplate your blessing and abundance that you may go to bed that night content and grateful. And after you've got those two things in your head or on the post-it note, contact me at the end of the week. Call me up or email me what you discovered, what you found, where it was difficult for you to follow through and when it was rewarding. I want to know. Jesus calls us to create a Sabbath community a community in which rest is a sacred part of our existence. A community in which we are not measured by our accomplishments, but rather by the quality of our relationships with God and with other people. A community whose very existence depends on our ability to come away to a deserted place and rest a while. May we answer God's call to become a Sabbath community by responding to God's, to Jesus' invitation and making rest a regular part of our routine. Amen.